It's great to see all of you here today, and I want to extend a special welcome to all of our online church family members. We're glad that you're with us, whether you're in the first row or the back row. Any back row people, wave at me, back row people. Yep. Whether you're first row, back row, we're so glad that you're with us today. Maybe you're driving your car, you're watching from home, you're listening at the gym. We believe that you're not here by accident. We believe that God, the God of the universe, reached down from heaven, and while you had a choice, he had a greater choice in bringing you here today in this environment to sit in your seat so that you can engage by lifting up his name in worship and learning of his love and experiencing his grace as we sit under the teaching of the word together. Now, before we dive in, though, I hope that all of you had a very happy Thanksgiving. Everybody have a good Thanksgiving. I have a friend who talks, yeah, happy Thanksgiving to all of you. I have a friend who talks about the five F's of Thanksgiving, okay? Here they are. Here are the five F's. First of all, there is family, right? There is faith. There's food. There is football, And there's a four-day weekend. Now, who doesn't love that, right? It's wonderful to celebrate and have Thanksgiving and to just thank God for the many blessings that he has given to us, man. We are so blessed as a people, and I'm so grateful to be with you this weekend here at Pathways. And if you're a guest, I believe that you came at a phenomenal time in the life of our church and what God is doing here. And I can't wait to share with you this final installment of a series called Jonah and Me. You, You heard that song at the top of the service, right? A child of love. Well, you're a child of love and so is Jonah. And and the story of Jonah is simply this, that that no one is outside the, the reach of God's love. He is relentless in his pursuit of you and of me. So if you would go to Jonah chapter four in your Bible today, that's where we're gonna be. But before we dive into God's word together, can we bow for a word of prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God of relationship. You are, you are so faithful. You are a faithful God. You're a good God. And you want to be in relationship with every single person on planet Earth. God, thank you for being with us in the ups and the downs, in the mountains and the valleys. God, in the joys and the sorrows. God, thank you that you want to speak to us and that you want to listen to us. And so now, God, I pray as we come and as we open our hearts to your word, I pray that you would speak to us individually. God, we're all at different places in life and in faith. And God, I pray that you would reach down deep into our hearts and that you would speak to us in such a way that would shape our will so that in the days to come, we would live differently for your glory and for the world around us. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everyone who agreed with this prayer said, amen. Amen. Now, if you're new or you haven't been with us in this series, let me just do a quick review. Quick review of Jonah. Chapter one, Jonah is called to go to the great city of Nineveh. God says, go, and Jonah says, no. What does he do? Well, he boards a ship and he goes in the opposite direction. He goes in the opposite direction of Nineveh to what modern scholars would believe uh, today is Spain. And so God uh, uh, throws a storm in Jonah's path to get his attention. And this storm is is really, it's violent. It is a, it, the magnitude of the storm is devastating such that Jonah is thrown overboard. Now in chapter two, we find that, that God provides a great fish. You could entitle chapter two, hitting bottom. Because there Jonah is at the bottom of of the sea for three days and three nights in the the belly of this great fish. And he has a a conversation with God and he repents and he turns and he decides to go to the city of Nineveh. Last week, Pastor Michael did a really nice job in, in talking about no hopeless souls. So in chapter three, we find that 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 Jonah decides to be obedient to God. He goes and he shares an eight-word message from God for the people of Nineveh. Here's God's message 
through Jonah. Eight words, here it is, in chapter three, verse four. It says, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. In other words, Jonah says, listen, you got 40 days to get right with God. You, you need to repent of your sin. You need to obey God. You need to follow him. You need to follow him. So he goes and he shares this message. And what do the Ninevites do? Well, they receive the message. They respond to the message and they repent to God of their sin. And the history books tell us at this time, Nineveh is a city of about 600,000 people. 600,000 people give their lives to God. They follow Yahweh's way. In fact, it is so powerful that the king of the king of Nineveh, he issues this proclamation. Listen to what he says. He says, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. In other words, go on a fast. Do not let them eat or drink. Verse eight then, he says, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. In other words, I want you to grieve. I want you to repent. I want you to turn. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Then he says this, who knows? Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. This is what the, the, the king of this wicked city, he issues this proclamation. Can you imagine if our president, not just our president today, but any president in United States history got on national television and gave this kind of proclamation? That would be a wow, wouldn't it? That'd be a wow. And yet this is what takes place in Nineveh. All of these individuals turn to God. Now, if we were to stop right there at the conclusion of chapter three, we could say that, that arguably Jonah went down in history, in biblical history, as the, the, the greatest, at least the most effective prophet. I mean, an eight word prophecy and 600,000 people came to God? Whoa, like fist bump, good job. Wow, Jonah, you rocked it. But the story doesn't end in chapter three. There's a fourth chapter, and this is the most important message of the entire series, and here's why. Because God saves Jonah. God saves Jonah. As much as he's concerned for the great city of Nineveh, God is concerned for his friend Jonah. And he's concerned for you and for me. God's love reaches to every single person. God saves Jonah. So chapter four opens up and we read these words in verse one. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became very angry. This is what he prayed to the Lord. He said, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew, I knew, God, that, that you are a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Let's stop there. Now, what's going on here? Don't you think Jonah should be really excited? I mean, after all, he took God's message, he delivered it to the city of Nineveh, and the Ninevites repented. You, you would think that, that Jonah would be like, hey, this is great, fantastic. Instead, he's angry. Why is he angry? What's up? Like, time out. What's going on here? Well, here's what's happening here. Jonah is struggling with God's decision to forgive the Ninevites. Why? Because if you remember earlier, the king said that the people of Nineveh were a wicked people and they were violent. Give up your violence. They were some of the most wicked people on the face of the earth in this time period. And Jonah didn't like what was taking place, how God, that's why he said all the way back, remember in the, the first installment of this series in chapter one, the reason that he ran is because he was afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid that God was going to forgive his 
enemy. You say, what do you mean his enemy? Well, the Ninevites, the Ninevites were conquerors. The Ninevites, the historians tell us, they, they, were, uh, they were part of the Assyrian Empire and the Assyrians were conquerors. Now, not to be too graphic here, but I, I want to bring into focus the kind of violence that they participated in. When the Ninevites would come and they would storm a city, oftentimes they would do a couple different things. They, 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 would, they would impale people on stakes. They would skin people alive. They would cut out their tongues. I mean, there were some ruthless people. They, they would rape women and, and young girls. They, they were just so violent. In fact, uh, historians tell us that when the Ninevites would come to certain cities, that dwellers would actually choose to commit mass suicide rather than fall into the hands of the Ninevites. These were wicked people, totally 100% depraved. And not only that, but the Ninevites attacked and they hurt God's people, the Israelites, Jonah's people. Now, to bring this a little closer to home, Here's, let let me try to bring this into focus a bit for all of us. You remember what happened last week in Waukesha? You remember how uh, Daryl Brooks uh, took his SUV and plowed through a Christmas parade, killing five individuals and injuring many more? Now, can you imagine, can you imagine for a moment, if God said, if God said to you, if one of your family members died in that Christmas parade and God said to you, I want you to go to the cell of Daryl Brooks and I want you to extend my forgiveness and my love. Is that an easy to do? No. Jonah had to go to an entire city filled with Daryl Brooks's and he had to extend God's message of love and forgiveness. For Jonah, he was angry. He didn't want to do this. In fact, this is what verse three says. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. How angry is he? Simply put, he'd rather die than watch the Ninevites come to follow the God that he loved and served. And this is what the Lord said in verse four. Is it right for you to be angry? In other words, Jonah, is your anger justified? This is one of two questions that that God is going to pose to Jonah in chapter four. Is your anger justifiable? Like, come on, Jonah. Well, Jonah doesn't respond to the question. Rather, this is what he does. Jonah had gone out and he sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter. He sat in its shade and he waited to see what would happen to the city of Nineveh. What's going on here? Well, Jonah goes outside the city. He isolates himself and he wants to wait and see. He wants to see what God is going to do. In other words, Jonah is hoping that God is going to change his mind and he's hoping that that God is going to lower the boom on Nineveh. He wants the Ninevites to be destroyed and so he wants to wait and see and he wants to see what God is going to do. To do, He's hoping that God will change his mind. Now, this is interesting. It raises a valid point that, that we need to be aware of theologically and, and really speaking when it comes to our own faith and commitment to God through Jesus Christ. And that is this, that just because we repent of our sin, it doesn't obligate God to forgive us. Just because we turn and we repent, just because we confess, it doesn't obligate. God doesn't, he is not bound. He doesn't have to do that. His forgiveness and his ongoing mercy and grace in our lives is just another demonstration of how compassionate and what a gracious God we serve. Amen? And so, Jonah is waiting and he's seeing if God would perhaps just change his mind because you know what? He doesn't want the Ninevites. He doesn't believe that the Ninevites deserve God's love. He doesn't deem them worthy. Verse six, 
Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was, he was very happy about the plant. Very happy about the plant. Verse seven. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. Everybody say, ugh. That was really good. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Now, at this point, you got to wonder if, if God was thinking to himself, you know what, Jonah? Like, you're an emotional wreck. One moment you're happy. I mean, then the next moment you are sad as back to death and anger. And, and like, you're just all over the map. I told you to go to Nineveh. You said no. You went in the opposite direction. Then I provided a fish. I was merciful to you. The fish burped you up on the beach. You were gracious enough to obey me. But you know what? Your obedience was not a reflection of what was happening in your heart. Don't miss this. When Jonah went to Nineveh in chapter three, he was externally conforming to the, obe to the ways and obeying God's will for his life, but inside his heart was all wrong. Uh, parents, uh, you remember when you were driving your strong willed child, because we all have one, right? And you put him in the back seat and you had him in the in the in the car seat deal. And it's like the it's like the little girl. It's like the little girl who says to you, says, On the outside I'm sitting down, but on the inside I'm standing. That's what Jonah was doing in chapter three. So God revisits the question that Jonah didn't answer. This is what he asks again, the question. He said, is it right for you, Jonah, to be angry about the plant? This time Jonah responds. He's very angry. In fact, in the original language, the, the Hebrew, this is what he says. Jonah says, it is, it is. He's enraged, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. In the original, here's what Jonah's doing. He's actually, he's using profanity toward God. He's, he's swearing at God. He is so enraged that God would extend his love and his forgiveness to the Ninevites. And he says, I do have a right to be angry. Now, Here's what God is doing in this moment. God is demonstrating, he is displaying his mercy toward Jonah. He, he, he's working with Jonah. He wants to show Jonah the, the, the brokenness and the ugliness that's inside of his heart. He wants to reveal something about Jonah and how twisted he is when it comes to, to the God that he knows and that he loves. There was something deeply broken inside of Jonah. And so God, in his mercy, he says to Jonah, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or you didn't make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. And then he draws this comparison. And should I, being God, not have concern for this great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Should I not be concerned about them Jonah, like what right do you have to be angry? I'm the one who made this plan grow to ease your discomfort, to make you happy. And then I sent the worm that it might die and a wind that you might get so frustrated and angry. Shouldn't I have the same concern for the city of Nineveh? These 120,000 children, how do we know we're children? Because they can't tell their right hand from their left hand. 
In other words, Jonah, do you want me to kill 120,000 innocent children? Wake up, Jonah. Dude, wake up. Don't you see your heart? Don't you see the brokenness? Don't you understand, Jonah? Like, that's not who I am. So, what can we lift from this final chapter in the book of Jonah? By way of application, like, like the question is, what does Jonah got to do with me? You know, we, we, we titled this series, Jonah and Me. What does Jonah got to do with me? So with the time that remains, I wanna give you two insights, two insights that I believe that God wants to speak to us around the life of Jonah. What does Jonah got to do with me? First of all, is this, life flows from the, say that word right there. Life flows from the heart. Don't miss this. Jonah did everything right externally, but internally, his heart was totally wrong. He was completely 100% rebellious toward God. You know, we think about the heart. If we're not careful as believers, we can think that all of life and the fullness of life and what God has to offer us is done through works of righteousness. But that is completely inaccurate. All of life and the fullness of life is experienced when the righteousness of God fills our hearts such that we obey in a way that starts on the inside. One of my favorite commentators, Warren Wearsby, says it this way, the heart of every problem is a matter of the heart. How's your heart? How's your heart? How's, how's your heart? It's the heart. God was so concerned about Jonah's heart because he knew, he knew that life flows from the heart. A second thing that we can gain from Jonah's life is discovering just how wide. God's net is, is wide. His net is so wide. God, God, he wants to see every single person come into relationship with him. God relentlessly pursues people. There is no individual that is too far from God. There is no individual that is outside the reach and the compassion and the mercy of God. The heart of God, while God is a just God, while God, while God exercises justice in ways that we, we don't understand, his mercy is greater than his justice. If that were not the case in less than 30 days, we would have no reason to celebrate Christmas. Christmas is the demonstration, is the proof that God's mercy reigns supreme because he sent his one and only son. The apostle Paul says, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. That's how wide his net is. God's net is so wide. It's so big. He wants every single person to come into a relationship, in a communication, to experience his love and his mercy and his grace such that our lives are transformed. This is the heart of our God. Isn't his heart amazing? Amen. So, some questions for us to consider. First question. How's your heart? How's your heart? If, if, if we could strip, if we could peel back all the layers of your life, like all of your stuff and your relationships and all the things that, that you think makes you and, and all, of those, all of those traits and, and everything, if you could get to the core, like how's your, your heart? 
Like that thing inside of you, the, the, the seat, the, the throne of, of, of your decision making and, 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 and all of your cognitive thoughts and those deep things inside of you, those things that are so mysterious and peculiar of wonder and amazement and yet things that are so scary and sometimes we don't understand. How's your heart? If life flows from the heart, then we have to ask ourselves as we enter into this Christmas season, as we get ready to flip the calendar to 2022, how's your heart? This is something that God has been speaking to me. Something that God has been showing me, Adam, your heart, your heart, you have, you have some work to do on your heart. Now there's probably a lot of ways that we can investigate and discern how our heart is doing, but if we were to be true to the text, I think there's three things that we can, three questions that we can ask ourselves when we look at Jonah's last chapter because he's super transparent. So if you're taking notes, jot these three questions down. How's your heart? Ask yourself this question. What makes you happy? What makes you happy? You know what Jonah made happy? You know what made him happy? When he had creature comfort, when the leafy plant grew over, he was happy. He was happy, but he wasn't happy when 600,000 people came to experience God's love and mercy. He wanted to lower the boom. He wanted them annihilated. What makes you happy? Second question, what makes you angry? What makes you angry? You know what, Jonah? Jonah? You know what he was angry at? He was angry at the fact that God was merciful and compassionate and slow to anger, that God would forgive. You know where that phrase is found? That's actually found in Exodus chapter 34. It's the first time we see the description of God being slow to anger and abounding in love, gracious and compassionate, turning from anger. Why? Because in Exodus 34, if you will, it was like God's wedding day with his people. In Exodus 34, it's the second time that, that Moses, the great lawgiver, went up to Mount Sinai. The first time he went up and he received the law, the Ten Commandments, and he came down. And what were God's people doing? They were worshiping around the golden calf. They were essentially, in effect, on God's wedding day with his people, God's people were cheating on God. They were worshiping an idol. And Moses, so enraged, he threw down the tablets. And the second time, God calls Moses back up on the mountain and he says, Moses, I know you're angry, but I want you to know who I am. I'm slow to anger, abounding in love, gracious and compassionate. That's the first time we hear that phrase. Jonah knew who God was, but Jonah didn't want the Ninevites to know who God was. What makes you angry? You know, anger is a secondary emotion. A anger is just, masking a deeper hurt or wound or something. And I don't know what that is for you, but, but what makes you angry? You should search that out. It's a great indicator of your heart. And then finally, what makes you want to give up? What makes you want to give up? Listen, Jonah wanted to quit. He was done. What makes you want to give up? Here's what I can say this weekend. If God is calling you to quit something, then quit. But if God is not calling you to quit something, I don't know, maybe it's a marriage, maybe it's a job, maybe it's another relationship. If God's not calling you to quit that, then don't quit. And if you do quit, here's what I know according to Jonah's story, that a storm is coming and that storm will intensify until you repent and you return to God. Because the cure for a broken heart, for an ugly heart, for a wounded heart, the, the cure is found in repentance. That the cure is found in turning to God's mercy and his love, and he will welcome you back. The second question we have to ask ourselves is simply this How wide is your net? How wide is your net? Are you good with Muslims receiving? God's love and grace and forgiveness among people, people of a different country? Are you okay with somebody who's in our country illegally? Is your net wide enough for them? 
Is your net wide enough for somebody from a different political party than you? Is your net wide enough for someone with a different skin color? Is your net wide enough for someone from a different sexual orientation or persuasion? Is your net wide enough for those who struggle with mental illness? Is your net wide enough? Is your net wide enough for the person that hurt you the most, that betrayed you, that walked out on you, that abused you? Is your net wide enough for that person to experience God's love and grace? How wide is your net? How wide are your arms to receive people with love and acceptance. Pathways Church, this is a very important question for us to ponder. Over the course of the last week or two, this is something that personally I had to repent of. There are some people that are outside my net. There's some people that I struggle to see how God's love, I'm not sure if they deserve it and that scares me. I had to repent, God help me. How wide is your net? You know, this is an important message for us at Pathways Church because at Pathways Church, we want to reach all people. We want to reach every single person with the gospel, with the good news of Jesus Christ. We want all people to come to a saving faith and a relationship with God. We want all people. Every single person is worthy to be saved. Every single person matters to God and because they matter to God, they matter to us or they should matter to us. We wanna see all people come to know Jesus Christ. We need more black people in our church and we need more white people and we need more brown people too. We need more educated people and more uneducated people. We need more men and we need more women. We need people who have no tattoos and we need people full of tattoos. We need people with blue hair and we need people with no hair. We need people who are, who are so strong and we need people who are so weak. We need people who are rich and we need more poor people. We need all kinds of people. We need people at both ends of the spectrum when it comes to their play. We need people. We need people. Our, our net needs to be as wide as God's net. We need to be so loving and so accepting. We need to welcome people here at Pathways. They should be able to run into this place and feel the love of God in such a way that they say, oh man, I can't help but being a part of, of this community of people. Friends, if you call Pathways Church your home, listen, we should be demonstrating, we should be showing people how life really is when people find faith and hope and love in Jesus Christ. That when they enter our community, they sense that we're a people who are diverse and broad and and background and experiencing yet because under the the blood and the banner of Jesus Christ, we can serve and we can be in community, we can love, we're brothers and sisters. Our net needs to be wide. And when people come, we we should say, we know. We know where you are. We've been there. And to some degree, we're, we're there too. But by the grace of God, we're changing. And we're being conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ because we want to know him and we want to follow him in order to be like him. Amen? Now, let me be very, very clear. Don't miss this next statement. While our net needs to be wide and as big as God's net, and while we wanna welcome every single person here at Pathways Church, just because we welcome every single person doesn't mean that all is tolerated here. While the net is wide, the message is very narrow. The way is narrow. Jesus said uh, the, the, the road to eternal life, it's a narrow road and few, few find it. Anything outside 
of the Bible. The Bible is the ultimate standard of life and faith. If it's outside, the Bible is the blueprint for our lives. If anybody is a part of our church at any level and they're living outside of God's commands, his ways, his will revealed in his word, then all people must repent and come back in alignment and conformity to the word of God. Widen it, narrow way. Amen? So you're here today. And as we wrap up, I wanna invite all of you to bow your heads with me. Because I believe that there are a couple questions that we have to ask ourselves. The first is, how's your heart? The second is, how wide is your net? Jonah was a faithful follower of God. He was a believer, if you will. And yet Jonah needed saved. There's some things inside of him that are broken and ugly. Maybe you're here today and you need to repent of some sin. Some things that you know that you're not following the Lord. I want to give you a moment to do that right now. Maybe you're watching online today or you're in this room and today you've never experienced God's love and his mercy. You know, this whole series could be summarized with one statement that I've tried to weave in each week, and that is this, that you can run out on God, but you can't outrun God. You can't outrun God, friend. You're here today, and you want to repent. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ. You want to be in a right relationship with God the Father. He's made a way. His name is Jesus. If you've never done that, or if you've taken some steps away and drifted, you can return, you can repent, you can come back to faith. If that's you today and you're in this room, would you just lift up your hand in this moment? I want to acknowledge you. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you in the back. Yes, thank you to the side. Yep, thank you. I see you right in the front. Anybody else? If you're online today, just go ahead and type in the chat. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm giving my life to Jesus. Do it. Tell somebody. Yes, I see you, young man. It's a big decision. It's awesome. God will forever change your life. You follow him. You follow him. One of the things I love about Pathways is that we don't pray alone. We don't pray alone. So would you pray with all of those who are making decisions for Jesus today? Would you say this with me? Heavenly Father, Thank you for loving me, for sending your son Jesus for me. I repent of my sin. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Thank you for dying for me, Jesus. I receive your salvation by faith. Now place your Holy Spirit inside of me that I might follow you. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I thank you for our congregation. God, I pray that you would continue to grow us in your ways, God. God, I pray that you would expand our net. I pray that next weekend as we host Fatai and as we enter into this Christmas season, God, that you would do exceedingly abundantly more than we can even imagine or think. God, keep our hearts right. God, it's not what's happening out there. It's who we have in here in our hearts. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the story and the witness and the testimony of Jonah. God, we pray now that you would go with us. God, that we might be changed and live for you in a way that bring you glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the strong son of God. And everyone who agreed with this prayer shouted, amen, amen. Hey, can we celebrate those individuals who made decisions today? That's exciting. That's exciting, that's exciting, that's exciting.